God is the gauge of his grace. God is the gauge, not ourselves, not what we want, not how we want, but God is in charge. And this is the God who knows you, who loves you. Now, I chose this title partly because I wanted to be alliterative. That happens to me. I couldn't quite find the word I wanted to fit in the title in order to say, we cannot force the hand of God for our justification and salvation. We can't force God's hand. Even when we do our very best to use the very law he has given through Moses, the law expanded in the Old Testament, the law as it is refined in the New Testament, or whatever law we expect to use to tell God that he has to let us into his eternal glory because of what we have done. That's the goal of religion, to end up where God is. That's why we have our Bibles, our teachers, our preachers, so we can gain the prize ourselves. Sometimes we make it too easy, and sometimes we make it too hard. Paul was wishing his Jewish brethren were not trying to do it on their own through the practice of an obedience to the law of Moses, because Jesus Christ has already gained the end result for us, the justification of our souls, so that we can stand before the throne of God guiltless. But we try to decide what God expects of us. That's not true for all of us, but probably most of us. But being an expert in the law, in practice and in observance, is really beyond most of us. Do you have any idea, I wonder, what it takes to become a lawyer? If you're not a lawyer, you probably don't quite. I had to make sure I looked it up. What does it take to graduate with a JD degree so that you might become a lawyer? Well, it starts when you're young. You take school very seriously. You learn to do your work as it's assigned. You don't miss any steps. If you're really good at it, maybe you can manage to have the top grades. You move from elementary school into junior high or middle school, or maybe right to high school, and you keep up the good work at every stage. When you're still two years from completing high school, you start to choose the college you want to attend. Oh, you start to make the inquiries, start to look for the scholarships and ways to finance college and then start to research what you need to apply for the school you want to attend. When you're about through your 11th grade of school, still at a junior level in high school, you take a couple standard achievement tests, not just the state tests to graduate your grade, but the ACT or SAT or some such test that the bright students always brag about and the common students simply dread. Then you send in your applications your test scores, your high school transcripts, and a plug of money for each application and wait and pray. Well, if you get into the college that you want, you're still a long way from that JD degree, which comes from the Latin word for doctor of laws. You have to continue to do well in college. You have to take a bunch of classes that are different from an art student or a mathematician or a teacher. You have a different goal. So as you're near your graduation with a Bachelor of Arts degree in an appropriate field, you start to look for a law school you will attend as a postgraduate student. You begin to pray that you'll be able to pay off your college and law school loans before you die, even while making the application to one or two law schools. Then as you graduate your four-year college, you apply yourself to prepare to take something called the LSAT, or law school admission test, which is required to enter a law school program. Now, this test is offered only a few times a year, and worse, if you don't pass it, you may not begin your law school this year, and you can only take it a maximum of five times in five years. And if you're determined to be a lawyer, but just don't have the right stuff, and you keep trying and trying and trying to pass the LSAT, After seven tries, you can't take it anymore. You're off the list. Seven tries in your life is all you get. Ah, but when you pass it, you enter the law school you were accepted into, and right at first, it sounds like a really good idea. It's almost as if most of your college classes don't matter anymore, though. You better like to read as you digest the volumes and volumes of law books and the process of researching law in your chosen specialty. And as you learn, you apply and you debate and you 
are graded, you're evaluated, your advisors read your paper and chart your progress and your future prospects. And you may be granted the degree of Juris Doctorate, a degree earned by long hours in the library and writing and speaking. Then you're not done yet. Once the Juris Doctorate is complete, the graduate is ready to sit for their state bar exam and receive their license to practice practice law when they pass it. Now, you don't just go out and hang out a shingle and open a law office. A lawyer needs to spend years learning the ropes and legal, legal researchers and assistants and perhaps junior partners in someone else's law practice first. You and I have both met or heard of a lot of pretty good lawyers, pretty good attorneys, and a lot of poor ones, or unethical att attorneys, or just plain sloppy ones. And some of them become judges. It's a good thing that the state bar associations are made up of many lawyers that are generally interested in proving, proving the reputation and the value of lawyers in our country. Well, now, I've rattled on for a while and I haven't even read scripture, but here's my point. If it takes that much just to become an expert in one area of the law of man, what do you think it will take to become an expert at practicing and obeying God's law for all your life? That's why Paul needs to remind us that the law of God is actually not our way into heaven. Oh, I know, I know. We've been given this incredible book, this incredible book we call the Bible, and it really is incre incredible. Bible in English comes from a Greek word, biblia, which means little scrolls. Our canon of 66 little scrolls or books written by mostly men as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God is our Bible. It's an incredible book for so many reasons. It's the record of God's interaction with mankind. It claims two things at once, that it is written by men and it is written by God, or literally it is God breathed into the various writers. The five books of Moses known as the Torah or law start with creation, but were only written down during the 40 years between Moses' encounter with God on Sinai and when the Israelites were on their way into Canaan. For us, that's Palestine, about 13 centuries before Jesus, the Messiah, and then Joshua was written in the next half century. The wisdom writings of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes were added from about 1,800 years before Jesus, then the books of the prophets from about 800 to 400 years before Jesus' birth. But think about it, by the time of Jesus, with all the enemies of Israel and even exile into Babylon, the sacking of the temple and the massacre of the priests, the law of God had been preserved, treasured, and recopied by the people of Israel for 40 generations or so in a mostly preliterate society. No wonder it was called sacred scripture. Oh, scripture, by the way, just means writing. But in the context of religion, we usually all know what is and what isn't scripture. As incredible as all this is, the law of God, knowing the law of God, practicing law, the law of God, obeying the law of God will never earn your justification and salvation by itself. As Paul found out, the good law of God showed him his sin, not his saintliness. You see, the law of God is only the minimum standard for living as the people of the holy God the creator of the universe. And if you are guilty of once failing that law, you're not righteous and you failed to earn the right to be in the same heavenly space as the holy God for eternity. That cannot come by the law, but by faith. And that faith enters us into the grace of God. That is actually faith in the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Now, in Romans 9 and 10, Paul the Apostle is lamenting this problem as he thinks about his fellow Jews. What's the problem and what's the solution? Well, we discover that some have attained righteousness. Now, Jesus was born, he lived, he died, and he ascended into heaven as a Jew. He was the Messiah the Jewish nation had been waiting for since the last days of Moses, the one they hoped would make their little nation once again the earth shaker that it was when they marched out of Egypt for the promised land after God had disgraced Pharaoh. At first, the Jews had mostly missed Jesus. But when his words scandalized them and called them on the carpet for kowtowing to the Roman oppressors, turning the temple into a marketplace and the religion into a ritual instead of a relationship with God, they decided to get rid of him. Now, of course, it's not so easy to be rid of the Son of God. He rose from the dead. 
He inspired his disciples and changed the hearts and lives of all who would believe in him for their forgiveness, their justification, and their salvation, which would get them into heaven. Paul wasn't on Jesus' side, not at first. He was with the self-preserving Jews and just knocked him off his horse on the way to Damascus when he was on his way to arrest some believing Jews. It was while he was recovering that God told him he would be the one to bring the good news of God's Son, the Savior of the whole world, to the people who weren't Jewish, the Gentile. You see, the Jews of Jesus' day had forgotten that God's promises to Abraham, the grandfather of Israel, said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then in Genesis 18:18, 18, 18, as the three messengers of God are sent to Abram and Sarah before the birth of Isaac. God was speaking to his messengers and said in verse 18 of Genesis 18, Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. So we have the promise given to Abraham. We have the promise reiterated to the very messengers of God that stood in Abraham's presence. And the promise of God's blessing for all families of the earth in or through Abraham, that all the families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's descendants. But in Paul's day, the Israelites were still focused on their own survival, and that made anyone else, the Gentiles, their enemies, not deserving of what God had given to them. So they turned back to the law which God had given to them and to no one else, and kept it from anyone else. They guarded it. They built a wall around it. They kept it from others. Then Jesus came, and Jesus let them know they were wrong. Then Jesus came to Paul and let him know that he was wrong. Now, Paul's writing to the Roman church about his Jewish brothers and wishes they had believed the good news that Jesus of Nazareth is their hope for heaven. And Jesus of Nazareth is the one who a lot of Gentiles had already believed in by now. Why weren't the Jews flocking to Jesus. Paul writes this in Romans 9, 30 and 31. What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel pursuing the law for righteousness has not achieved the righteousness of the law. So here we are. The Gentiles weren't looking for a Jewish Messiah. They weren't following the Jewish scriptures. They didn't understand about the one true God until the gospel was brought to them. But now, after hearing the good news of Jesus, that God, the creator of the universe, loves them so much that he's given them a way into eternity with the holy God instead of the eternity of dying in hell because they were not righteous. Everyone, it seems, wanted in except the Jews who had rejected Jesus. The Israelites have tried to make it by following the law, every piece and particle, but they made a mistake in putting the law at the center of their religion instead of putting God at the center of their lives, and so they didn't succeed. And that's because faith is the only way to righteousness. We miss that because we like to do things on our own. Here's what Paul said, thinking about why they had missed it so far in Romans 9, 32 and 33. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it, the law, by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, look, I'm putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over. Yet the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. If you trust that following the law will get you into heaven, that means you trust that you can do it yourself. And that means you can do it by your own effort. Who needs God, who needs faith in God. We have faith in his law, in this book right here. If we follow it, God has to let us in, right? That's right, isn't it? Well, that's the deception that legalism brings you. It says you can pretty much tell God what to do about your eternal soul because you deserve heaven. That's the offense of Jesus. That's the stumbling stone of the law. You think you've got this one handled. You have the handbook, you have the Torah. Do what it says, you're good. But Paul knows now that you need the rest of the story. The story of God's son who died with the words, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing on his lips. Knowing and believing the rest of the story means that by 
your belief, your faith in the saving power of God. In Jesus the Christ, you shall be saved. Read Romans 10, 13 for that confirmation. By faith, by faith, that's what's right. That's what works salvation. But it's not like they weren't trying these brothers of Paul, the other Jews. By the time of Paul, there were many Jews who were trying to get Israel back on track, to call Israel back from the brink of totally rejecting God for the sake of what they thought they were doing to save their nation. While the Sadducees were telling the people just to keep going through the motions and don't upset Caesar, the Pharisees were trying to turn everyone into legalists so that God would be pleased. And that was Paul's own mistake. And for a time, he was pretty sure that that was what every Israeli should do until grace slapped him in the face and took him by the shoulders and shook him out of his spiritual stupor to see God at work through Jesus Christ to save people, Jews and Gentiles from their sin. Even as he speaks of his heart for Israel to be saved, he knows of a fervor that is currently misplaced. He writes in Romans 10, 1 and 2, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them, the Jews, is for their salvation. I can testify about them that they have zeal for God but not according to knowledge. Paul's wanting the salvation of Israel became Paul's praying for the salvation of Israel. He put his deep desire into God's lap. He himself was a zealous Jew with a zeal for God that was ignorant of God's saving grace for too many years. He was lured by the movement that told him that only by the law could a human bridge the gap between earth and heaven. He used to wake up every morning with prayers and incantations on his lips, the law of God in his mind and the peace of God always out of reach until he discovered it wasn't his reaching for God, but God reaching for him that really mattered. That was the, that his fellow, fellow Jewish religious zealots lacked. Been there, done that, said Paul. It wasn't enough. Salvation by my own merit will always come up short. The minimum requirement for the people of the book is perfect obedience to everything in the book. And we just aren't good enough because trouble comes when we don't submit. Paul knew about pride. After all, he was good at being a good Jew. But he also knew since he met Jesus how far short he had come by his own effort. In Romans 10, 2-4, as Paul said again, I can testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Well, he can testify because that was his story. Because they disregarded the righteousness from God and they attempted to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. There's his self indictment zealous for God, not knowing his grace, ignorant of righteousness, building a system for salvation out of laws that really wanted to call God's people back to having patience and enduring faith in God. But if the law is at the center of your life and not God, it all goes the wrong way. You see, all of that means that submitting to the idea that only God can work salvation and I can't save myself is a little too much for the ones who want to do it. As, as humans, we really aren't good at submitting to an idea of faith when we have the rules of faith in front of us. But we're really good at building a religious system. We're really good at doing that to keep everyone on edge in fear of their souls because only a few can really attain the goal. That's what Paul's talking about when he says the Jews attempted to establish their own righteousness. Isn't it good when God gives you all the tools to do that? I mean, there's a temple so tall and so beautiful and grand and reserved for only a few to enter. The temple has its courts, the levels of barriers between the common people and the altar of sacrifice. The priests and the scribes kept the law for themselves until it was beneficial for them to sell copies to the lawyers, that is, the teachers and legalists among the people. Then those with the resources had the law of God, not the common people, so they could be the religious police for the behavior of the masses. They could stay in control, but that translated in control of what God wanted from them as well, not to submit to God's righteousness, but to establish a righteousness that they were in control of. But here's the truth that Paul had learned the hard way. God has provided in Jesus Christ, everything that's needed for life and salvation, he puts it this way, Christ 
is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the end result. It's the perfect resolution of the law that's been given to us and the grace of the God who gave it. It's not our efforts, but God's grace given through Jesus Christ that gives us a righteousness that God can accept. And this comes to everyone who believes. That's everyone who believes, not just lawyers, scribes, or priests, not just good Jews, but everyone, even Gentiles, even Gentiles. God is the, the gauge of his grace, not us. But God's grace is generous and available to all, even to me, even to you. And that's really good news because the law is hard, but faith is easy. If you insist on living by the law, you better be prepared for a lifetime of hard work to fulfill every jot and tittle of the book. But the problem is you can't pay the penalty for even one transgression. In Romans 10.5, Paul says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that's from the law. The one who does these things will live by them. So if you want to live by the law, you have to do the law. Laws are not written with extra credit for those who follow them. Laws are written only to provide the consequences of disobedience. So living under a shadow of consequences will wear you out. You're always looking over your shoulder, in effect. You're always wondering if someone will find out your secrets, expose your inequities and disgrace your name because everyone lives with the knowledge of their own shortcomings. Almost everything, but that's another story. The law is hard. Paul found out someone and something that is for our encouragement. In Romans 10, 6 and 7, but the righteousness that comes from faith speaks to us like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. You see, following the law is hard. The righteousness that comes from faith, that is from believing God for your salvation, means that you don't have to build a ladder to try and reach God to find the Messiah that's hidden in heaven. And you don't have to toss a rope over the abyss to rappel down into a Hades and stir Christ from the dead. Faith in God's work means faith that you know he already did the work for you. He already sent his one and only son to us so that believing in him, we might have life. It means you know he has already raised Christ from the dead to prove victory over death in the grave. Faith in the righteousness of God is a lot easier than law that tries to do it the hard way and fails every time. So the search is done. Faith is the answer. Here's the conclusion. Romans 10, 8 and 9. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God has already placed in your heart and on your tongue what is needed for your righteousness. Believe God as did Abraham and Moses and Joshua and David. Even before the time of Christ, they believed God. And that became their salvation because their belief in God was placed on the shoulders of Christ, their Savior. And know that God's love is that which calls you to himself, not his law that makes you afraid of the grave. Confess that Jesus is Lord. Believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and be saved. Faith is the answer you need. But then Paul still has his problem, his thoughts. If all Israel won't believe in Jesus, what do you do about God's promises to them? Romans 10, 16 to 17, Paul laments that not all obeyed the gospel. And he reflects that Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Paul says, for faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. So not all obeyed the gospel. The word of God that for obedience requires each one to believe. Even Isaiah struggled with the fact that he preached God's grace, but it seemed like no one had gotten it. But if you hear the gospel and believe in the one God sent, faith will become your righteousness, not law. So Paul asks the question in Romans 11, 1, I asked them, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. So that means that Paul, the Israelite, must rest in this hope and promise with all the others. In the same way then, there is also at the present time a remnant chosen by grace. In other words, if God can save a Jew like me, he can save the whole number 
of those that he has gauged to be ready for grace by God's own design. For now, just a remnant, but later, all that he has called will be his by faith in the one he sent by the grace of God. In the meantime, God saves the whole world while Israel watches. And in Romans 11, 11 and 12, Paul gives the reason. Well, I ask then, have they stumbled in order to fall? Absolutely not. On the contrary, by their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now, if their stumbling brings riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will the full number bring? Paul is looking forward to wonders that God is working. This is all for the final victory of Christ for all that have been called. This is the victory of grace that the Gentiles, the rest of the world, might be saved. And Israel's great desire, gain the riches of grace back home for their own salvation. For God sent his son into the world because he loved the world, not just the Jews only, but also not the Gentiles only. Christ is for all. He is for me. He is for you. Make sure that it is by faith you seek the peace of God, and it shall be yours as you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, as you seek forgiveness for your sins in his name, and as you rely on God's grace by faith for your future in heaven. May God be your hope and your salvation and confirm in you the faith that you have even right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for giving us a place by faith in your family forever. We pray in Jesus, the name that saves us all. In his name we pray.